Hi, morning everyone. Eric here. Um, welcome to the oral presentation um, session on sex and drugs, part one. Um, I'm Eric. I'm your chair for this session and the moderator for this um, session is Alan. Uh, our role as the host of this session <clears throat> is to make sure that everyone, our presenters and attendees, have a fruitful and engaging session where we can share and learn in a relaxed and respectful way. Before we move on to the presentations, I would just very briefly like to remind everybody of the terms and conditions that we've all agreed to for this conference. We're all here in the spirit of active learning, discussion and respectful debates in order to address the challenges that we currently face in sexual health, well-being and social justice in Scotland. We have a zero tolerance policy for any abuse or attack. If any comments or questions are deemed inappropriate by myself or the moderators, you will not be able to speak or engage any further in this session. So a bit of housekeeping here. In this session, we're going to have two presentations, each about 15 minutes long, with some time left for questions afterwards. We've decided to do the two presentations and then pick up all the questions later on. Uh, if you have any questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A chat function that you will see on the right hand side of your screen, I think. Um, so put your questions there. If you want to verbally ask the question, just say, I would like to ask a question. Is something about, and just give us a brief description. You can also use the chat function for any engagement with other folks within the session, but I'm not really going to be picking up questions from there. So stick them all into the Q&A. Uh, you can get further information about the speakers from the bios and the conference brochure will give you kind of a summary of the presentation. We will be, oops, here we go. In this session, so we're gonna have two presentations from community-based organizations, Crew 2000 and the Scottish Drug Forum, two national agency with a key focus on the area of substance use. We will hear about the amazing and incredible, valuable work that they do, have been doing, that is responsive to the needs of the populations they support and driving forward how we as a nation approach preventive work and supporting people through the challenges that can come with substance use. So we're gonna hear a little bit about how um, the trend of kind of cocaine use in Scotland has been, and then a piece of research by the SDF. So I'll hand you over to Lee, who will give us our first presentation. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Lee. I'm a training officer with Crew 2000. So I'll just get my presentation up for you just now. So today I'm going to talk to you about cocaine use in Scotland and the effects that it has on the brain. So Crew, initially I'll tell you a bit about our service, was set up in the mid-1990s. It was set up by a bunch of conscientious young people who wanted to get accurate <clears throat> information out to the club population of Scotland. Uh, sorry. Since then we've grown. We uh, have a small office on Colburn Street. We have a counselling service, a drop-in, and since COVID started, a digital drop-in. We also have an outreach service and provide training to organisations around Scotland. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is cocaine and its use in Scotland. As you can see, prior to lockdown, the UK had the highest prevalence of cocaine use within Europe. So this is the 2018 figures. The UK was sitting at 2.7% of the population that had used cocaine in the past year. During lockdown, Crew 2000 did an online survey. Now, many participants from around the world took part in this survey, um, including people in Toronto, um, from around England, Wales, all over Europe, uh, age ranging between 12 and 54. Now, we had 107 participants, the majority of them were from around Scotland. And as you can see from this graph, as we expected, over lockdown, people's use did alter. Pills like MDMA, people started taking less of them. We did kind of expect that to be the case because these tend to be more recreational substances that people tend to use in group settings. As you can see, things like LSD and GHB use of that went down as well. Amphetamine use went down. 
MDMA powder use went down a bit. Ketamine use went down a little bit. Other psychedelics went down a bit. But cocaine, we had an over 50% rise in that. And for a psychostimulant drug, that's unusual when people aren't being able to socialise as much. So what's the reasons behind that? The other drugs went up as well that we'd expect to, alcohol, benzodiazepine, nicotine use, cannabis. See, you kind of expect the drug use to go up. People were sitting home alone. They were taking more depressant substances. When we have a look at the share of drug use within the European Union in 2021, so this is kind of the end of lockdown, cannabis use had increased. We know that. You know, everybody, unfortunately, tends to use cannabis and sees it more as a normalised drug. Again, cocaine use. If we look at the last year, it went up 1.2% across all of Europe. MDMA went up 0.9%, amphetamine 07 But cocaine, for a psychostimulant drug that people tend to associate with parties and clubbing and social use, for that to go up over 1% in a, in a year where the majority of people were locked up and kept isolated, there's got to be a reason for that. So we got in touch with SFAD and they sent us some of their figures for the last three years. Now, these are the calls that they've received from loved ones, you know, friends, family members of people that are using substances. As you can see, alcohol's always been high. And in Scotland, we kind of expect alcohol to be high. It does tend to be our main drug of choice. But cocaine... As you see there, it's been rising as well. And this year here, 2020 to 2021, it spiked. It was the second highest drug that people were calling SFAD about. While people were locked up at home by themselves, their friends and family were still concerned about their cocaine use. And this year as well, cocaine is at this time, it's the third highest drug that SFAD were receiving calls from so far this year. That's since April this year. SFAD, up to a few weeks ago, when I got these figures, it received 221 calls from people regarding cocaine. Out of these 221 calls, 37.5% of them were cocaine only. So that's over a quarter percent of people that are only using cocaine. They're not using alcohol, they're not using heroin, they're not using benzos, purely cocaine during lockdown. So you can see there's a mix of other drugs here as well. Benzos, probably to help with the come down, to be honest. Alcohol and cocaine tend to go hand in hand. People drink, people use cocaine. Xanax is a benzo, but it is one that's been seen more and more on the streets that is coming with its own problems. That mixed in with cocaine as well. That's just asking for problems here. Drug-related deaths are going through the roof because of benzos. Xanax is one of the main ones that's pushing this up. So when we're mixing it in with cocaine and increasing the risks of heart attacks and all the other issues that I'm about to talk about, you know, we're just... It's amazing that we've got the population that's surviving like we are. Let's move on to the next slide. So why do people continue to use cocaine through the lockdown? The way cocaine affects the brain is a very complicated process. People take cocaine and it blocks our dopamine receptors in the brain within the synapses here. So instead of the dopamine being reabsorb, uh, sorry, reabsorbed, we get this rush of dopamine, as we can see here, between the synapses. And this causes this euphoric feeling and encourages us to take more of the drug. The thing is, after a while, this flood of dopamine that we get during this release, doesn't it doesn't stay it disappears and then we come down and we want to take more so that we get that euphoric feel again 
and this keeps going and it keeps feeding into it. And the more we take, the more risk we're putting our body under. We're increasing our heart, we're increasing our temperature, you know, we're, we're putting all this stress onto our physical body and it can put us into synapses. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, it can put us into stimulant overdose. Now, we know these risks. We publicise these risks. Many, if not all, soap operas have put some kind of special on about these risks of cocaine use. People go out, they take cocaine, they have a heart attack, but it doesn't put people off. So we make sure people know what to do in an emergency. If you see somebody suddenly starting to sweat, you, know, you can't cool them down by taking off layers of their clothes, call an ambulance. If they start vomiting, call an ambulance. If their heart's racing and they start feeling anxiety and get this fear and panic, call an ambulance. Call an ambulance as quickly as possible and hopefully they'll be okay. But as we know, people go out to the clubs. This doesn't happen all the time. Thankfully, this doesn't happen all the time. But it, it kind of puts the risk into this bubble. This hasn't happened to me. This hasn't happened to my friends. So it's okay to continue taking this drug. I'm having a good time. This drug's enhancing my night out. Like I said, over COVID, people weren't having night out. They weren't going out. They weren't partying with their friends. But they were still taking cocaine. And that's because cocaine interrupts the way our brain processes things. And as I said, we know cocaine is a stimulant drug and it suppresses our appetite as well. And the way our brains are wired, it's to encourage us to do things that we need to do. So eating, for example. When we eat, our body releases dopamine. So it encourages us to eat. But we don't always get this euphoric high when we have food. So it starts to encourage us to, to do the full process of eating. You know, we enjoy shopping for food, we enjoy cooking. Sometimes we enjoy cooking more than we enjoy the food that we've made. And cocaine almost interrupts that pathway because it suppresses our appetite as well. It almost gets reinforced. So we take the cocaine, we don't get the same euphoric high, but we're still enjoying the process and getting the positive reinforcement of going to our dealer. Of cutting the line up. So even though we're not receiving the same euphoria when we take the cocaine, we're trying to, we take more and more to try and reach that euphoric high and put more and more pressure on our body, but we're not getting there. So why do we keep taking it? Because we're still getting all the rewards on the lead up to it and we're not feeling hungry. And the fact that it's a social drug probably doesn't help because we get the extra rewards from being with our friends. You know, so we are getting lots of rewards put into us that's encouraging us to take this drug that's really, really bad and putting us at high physical risk. But as well as getting all this, these rewards from all these basic things that we're doing, it's damaging our, or, so I can never say this, or, or, orbital frontal cortex of our brain. And this is the part of our brain that's responsible for our decision making. So SFAD get calls in, like the ones we can see on the screen here. My son's been using cocaine daily for the last three months. His mental health is erratic, he's paranoid, he's hearing voices, he's threatening to murder our neighbours. The police have been called, there's no support in place, and he won't engage with family. Friends, support. He probably knows all the risks that he's putting himself at. He probably hates himself. He's suffering a deep depression, but his orbital frontal cortex has been damaged. So although he knows these are bad decisions, his decision-making capability has been damaged to the point that he can't do anything but make these bad decisions because he's getting all the positive reinforcements from doing this. And his friends and his family and his doctors are probably all tearing their hair out and wondering why he's making these bad decisions. He's incapable to stop. He needs help, he needs support, but where does he go? 
unfortunately, a lot of the calls that SFAD have been getting are regarding people needing support. Most of their calls have been about trying to access treatment services, going to doctors, contacting addiction services, waiting for contact to be to be made, hoping that their loved ones are going to engage and they don't. And again, it's not because they don't want to. It's because this part of their brain's been damaged and they're unable to make these positive decisions, these good decisions. Instead, they continue to make bad decisions, disengage with services, and sink further and further into depression, paranoia, anxiety, and continue to take this drug that continues to make it worse. We need to do something to help break this cycle. We need support there within mental health services, drug services, and sexual health services. Because amongst all these risky decisions or risky sexual practices as well, people not using condoms, people sleeping with folks that they wouldn't normally sleep with, having rough sex, and getting themselves into some really bad situations. So what do we do? I am happy to provide as much training to anybody that wants it to help support mental health services, sexual health services and drug services, friends, family and whoever else needs it, understand this horrible cycle that people get into with cocaine. But we need more research, we need more study and we need more support. So what we can do at the moment is continue to give out as much harm reduction advice as possible. As far as mental health side of cocaine goes, sleep management helps. Trying to be a bit understanding of why they're making bad decisions and help and support them to make good decisions. They really need that help and support to make the good decisions. And sometimes that's just staying with them for a few hours to stop them from going to the dealers and understanding that they may be suicidal, but it doesn't mean they want to die. And I think that's it for me um, for now. Tell if anybody has any questions at the end. Um, so thank you very much. Our drop-in at Crew is open on Coburn Street every day apart from Sunday. Uh, the times are there. All our information there, by all means, contact me and, uh, yeah, back over to you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, thank you for that. I've in the past as a youth worker worked with Crew 2000 before, so it's an, it's an excellent kind of national agency that really is really trusted amongst uh, the different kind of partners as well. So I strongly encourage folks to get in touch with Crew 2000 as much as you can. If nothing else, you get to touch the box with all the different bits yeah. of all the chemicals. <laughs> well, the drop-in's fantastic. We've got the D new DJ booth and everything set up in there. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, so next up, we've got um, Adrian and we've got Louise, who will be kind of um, talking us through a piece of research that they've done. Over to you guys. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Lee. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our session where we're going to be talking about some research that we carried out pre-pandemic. My name is Adrian Hanna and I'm going to be having a discussion with my colleague Louise Bowman. We both work for Scottish Drugs Forum within the Sexual Health, Bloodborne Virus and Harm Reduction team. The research that was carried out by SDF, um, it took place pre-pandemic and it was um, with specific populations in order to inform the training that we deliver around sexual health and drug use. The specific populations being men who have sex with men who are involved in chemsex, people who use iPads, image and performance enhancing drugs, and people who are involved in transactional sex, selling or exchanging sex. We covered uh, four, we carried out the research in four health board areas, Grampian, Lothian, Glasgow and Fife. 
This morning, we are going to be looking specifically at the research that was carried out around transactional sex, and in particular, the research that Louise did with women involved in selling or exchanging sex. So the plan for the next 15 minutes or so is for me to ask Louise some questions and for Louise to tell us what it was she found during the research. I've got my notes here with my questions, so if I'm looking down, it's just to make sure I've not forgotten anything. So Louise, thanks very much for doing this session with me. Um, can I just start by asking how you actually got in touch with your interviewees? Yeah, well, <clears throat> because it was um, specific populations, um, SDF has um, a long-standing relationship with lots and lots of drug services, especially harm reduction, um, those that are supplying injecting equipment. But um, in terms of the specific populations, those working directly with women who might sell or exchange sex, I had um, links with Women's Support Project Scotland, Linda um, Thompson, phenomenal, put me in touch with sort of all the key players in each of those areas, and they were like the, the gatekeepers. And, you know, I have to say every single service, and whether it was drugs or, or specific, um, really working with women, um, you know, they gave me shadowing opportunities. We were able to sit in clinics, um, they create space for us, you know, so it was quite easy to snowball. And then, you know, through that, there's a bit of word of mouth, um, you know, but everybody was so welcoming. And I think it sort of built the trust or a trusted member of staff would encourage some other women, uh, women to take part. Thank you. Just thinking about the ages of the women you interviewed, roughly sort of how old were they? And also, was there a difference in attitude to being involved in selling or exchanging sex depending on the age of the women they interviewed? Yeah, so at the time of the research, they were between 24 and 51, but everybody had started um, or first sold or exchanged sex way before that, under 25, if not even, you know, okay. under the age of 16. Um, so what I would say is um, those that are more younger in this are those under 25 or like under 30 certainly were much more open about the fact they sold sex. It was like um, they owned it, you know, very open, would tell anybody and... Um, those over 35 were much more traumatised and mor mortified that they had been involved in any selling or exchanging. There's only one exception to that, and that was those females over 30, probably between 30 and 40, um, who actually set up their own websites and you know decided, I'm, I'm going to do it my way. There was no other men involved in that. So, yeah, they were the only ones that were, you'd sort of reconciled what they did and were quite open about the fact they they used um, web platforms to sell sex. So obviously women were selling sex online. Where else were they selling or exchanging sex? So so the advertising happens online. Um, it's not always the women that have set that site up, you know, but we'll come to that later. And I just realised that from when I was um, asking more questions during an interview. So um, online will offer maybe in calls to somebody's house or out calls. You, a woman might be part of a, a team that goes out group sex. You know, there was no consistent way that people um, sold sex, but you say there might be pop up brothels. There might be, um, you know, somebody would do it, and it sounds it's going to sound a bit crude, like a flash sale. You know, once a month they'll book a really nice hotel and advertise loads of stuff online. Unfortunately, homeless hostels are, 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 are somewhere where people sell or exchange sex, in the back of cars, um, on the street, you name it. But I did find that services were a way that women were getting identified as you were you're sort of hearing about their stories. What about the people who are buying sex? Who, who is actually buying sex? Just about everybody. It felt like doing the research about everybody and anybody. But um, I think those that really stood out for me is, you know, when interviewing those younger um, purchasers of sex, um, I would be told stories that they would often buy escorts and for an evening for a girlfriend experience. So all them and their pals would all book an escort for the night, be like a wife's and girlfriend's experience. Um, and, um, you know, that seemed to be a thing buying time of people. The other one that stood out for me really was, um, you know, people being taken advantage of by community members that they see every day. Now they're clearly 
withdrawn from from drugs or in a really desperate state and they'd be propositioned you know for a tenner here and there and then maybe get a phone call later on do you want to see my pal but they never in the whole time of knowing this person being propositioned when they looked okay you know or when they were not in distress and i think you also talked about uh, some women having regulars who would come to their home yeah so you know, those that took ownership kind of did have, um, you know, those that are promoting their own um, websites and stuff, they would have regulars, but the reason being was because, on balance, it was legal to have that. Whereas if they were shoplifting or selling drugs, um, that's illegal, and that would have massive mm-hmm. um, effect on their liberty and access to children, etc. Yeah. Um, can we move on to a question now, Louise, around how women first got involved in selling or exchanging sex? Um, So so again, I've spoken about those kind of using the exploitative. um, And when I say that, people, I'm talking about for a power card or for Valium tablets, the exchange of stuff. So I've spoken about that um, exploitative. Some may be coerced by their partner, you know, we're needing money. You could uh, could get us both money doing this. And it wasn't for great amounts of money, in in my opinion. Um, but yeah, mainly if you're looking at it, childhood sexual abuse, grooming, up grooming, getting somebody around to do some modelling and it progresses from there. Um, peers would get people into it maybe in the 90s and uh, be like, look at the cash I've just made last night, or get me involved, you know, just like you would get your friend involved in any other work. Um, and the other, God, something else I was going to say, is there anything I've missed on that? I, I think I was on my train. There's a link around child removal, Louise, if you want to say yeah, something so, about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what, what I was realising was, um, no, there was people, what I wanted to say was there was women who said to themselves, I went looking for lap dance and I went looking for brothel work. However, they've all recognised their childhood sexual abuse and they recognise it was some form of, you know, trauma response to that. But yeah, no, what I noticed, and it wasn't, you know, I was like, um, as I was doing these interviews, I'm like, hang on a minute. People are getting, having their children removed way before the somebody else gets starts coercing them and getting them on the game, if you like. Um, now, in drug deaths, it's really high that women who um, have children removed, you know, there's a, a link to that as well. So when we're looking at harms, you know, that's maybe one of the big predictors of women going into free fall um, and, and absolutely stopping to care about themselves and being available for those more predatory. Thanks, Louise. Um, what about services that women are in contact with? Is it mainly drug services that women are in contact with? So, you think? no, no, absolutely. The ones I interviewed, I, I know from I know from the services and the place I shadowed and the people that I've met since and the services I've met that 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 there are more. You know, there are, there there's, there was pockets of um, women specific services for those who sell or exchange sex. That funding ran out. But yeah, sorry to answer your question, majority those that are in medication assisted treatment, some are avoiding mm-hmm. it for childcare for not being identified um, by services. But yeah, the majority just had medication assisted treatment as a drug service. Some were using needle exchanges, but those smoking crack, there's no need for a needle exchange in their eyes, you know. So Perhaps you've only seen their, their prescriber once a month. And we know it's short appointments. We know how overwhelmed this, um, the, the prescribing um, system is as well. I think that the other thing as well is though, but some people could be in contact with up to six or seven services doing little bits of piecemeal. So maybe you have your CPN that you'll see once in a blue moon, your welfare, some might sort your food bank out for you. Somebody might be doing your criminal justice interventions, you know, but they're tiny little bits. Nobody was holistically looking at everything. Apart from the, the Encompass Network, another way in that low caseloads they had, brilliant, and really be able to look at what women wanted, needed, and built from basic needs up, really, um, with a view, whatever they wanted to do around whether they sell or exchange sex. That was completely up to the women, but it was about reducing harm. Mm-hmm. And I think you said as well that for the women who weren't involved in the likes of Encompass or another way, that they would be working with services who never asked them about selling or exchanging sex. No, that's correct. And see, see listening to the abortion care um, presentations was, was phenomenal yesterday. This silence breeds stigma, right? Mm-hmm. And also, women, the, the women who were presenting yesterday said, 
sometimes this research was the first time they spoke about abortion. Well, this was the same here because I was out engaging with, you know, explaining to them what it was, and they or you know, this is maybe sometimes the first time they've disclosed it as well yeah. because first of all, nobody's asked them. We yeah. don't. They've not nobody's speaking about sex, and some don't have a female worker either. So they'd be like, well, "Why would I tell a guy that?" So you know, yeah. these are little simple things. And also for some people, they won't go into services because they've not got any female spaces. Like there are just mm -hmm. women in the staff, yeah. just women in the waiting room, completely protected space. Um, and sometimes people have been coerced from the, the, the joint appointment thing as well and joint uh, mixed homeless accommodation. So you can understand yeah. that. You've kind of begun to answer my next question, which is what did the women tell you they need from services? Is there anything else you want to add to that, Louise? Because you have mentioned obviously about um female worker female only space that kind of thing so i think right what well, nobody the women didn't know what they didn't know right they didn't know what they could have so it, it, it was one of those ones but what they did say very simple things like if you're going to say you're going to call me call me i might not have credit but i'm waiting for that call if services could operate on a on chemists especially on a basis that factored in that people have got busy lives and might not be able to make it to the chemist during opening hours and um, being more flexible with appointments and not making them um but also information like Lee's just done the presentation there on cocaine most knew nothing about what the co what cocaine was doing to them they wanted to know they knew it wasn't healthy to to, to their chest and um, if they were smoking crack but the very basics they didn't know about bacterial infections stis contraception smears you know we're not it wasn't anything massive here they were the things that sprung to mind mm -hmm. and then from your point of view as a researcher what's your gut feeling about what women need women we're talking about so women who use drugs need something to do they're they need busy lives, you know, they're at the mercy of everything going on in their pretty run in their community that might be where the only thing you can do to fill the time is take drugs. And absolutely, you know, they need something to do, they need opportunities to, to, to move on, but keep busy. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I would say is, and especially with the pandemic, when we've been everyone's been advocating on behalf of, of, of those in need of welfare, systems are really complex. It's only those that design them that can really work their way through them very quickly. So we cannot do anything without women involved you know in the design and, and the delivery of the services as well and really feel so strongly about that the other thing i'd say is that um the promise we need to implement that in drug services or, or show how we are i know it's been um i see i see that it's you know been implemented in social work teams but i think we need to take a real approach to it um for drug using women which looks at never losing children um but if they were to be removed, that there'd be some sort of package there so that it doesn't become disastrous. People can be supported for the next baby, et cetera. So I, I don't know if that answers it all, but that, that, that to me, on top of just simple things like women-only spaces, but women involved in the design, again, would give you what, what they need. Yeah, and as you say, from the promise point of view, which if people don't know about that, that's really working to keep families together rather than removing children and children being put into looked after or accommodated services. Yeah, that's that's it. That's right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Louise. Back to you, Eric. Thank you very much for that, for that very um, engaging kind of um, conversation about um, the, the the findings of the, the research, Louise. Thank you. It sounds like you had a really interesting, very challenging, but also very rewarding time with uh, speaking with different people involved in kind of transactional sex. Um, there, there, there is a question um, from the floor asking um, whether there was a point of focus on exploring um men who sell sex yes it, it was open to to all if um and, and and it wasn't just women it was only mm -hmm. i only interviewed women the numbers were not massive come through but when we looked at it was somebody who was involved in chem sex who sold sex and who also used ipads so it came across all three and um, yeah the focus was not just women um, in that study and because chemsex was part of that study as well if that does that answer your question yes and is there um are there any are the findings of the kind of the bigger study is that put is that available somewhere yeah i can i can pop a link in the chat if that's easy for yeah. people 
certainly will be available, covers all three. And we're going to then publish just the, the standalone women one because it wasn't just women. You're correct. Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think it'll be great if we have something in the chat as well. Um, I've got a question for Lee, if that's okay. Um, so in terms of, we know that the, there's an increasing trend of cocaine use um, by folks, even within the lockdown setting. And, and you talked about how it can be very challenging for folks who know they shouldn't do it or they don't want to do it, but the brain you know, is damaged in a way that it makes decision-making quite challenging. So how would somebody, how could somebody without the kind of um, the network around them to support them into making those decisions a little bit quicker or a little bit better for themselves at a point, how can individuals take some sort of um, active decision-making process towards some sort of support? I, that's the thing, I can support just isn't out there and for this kind of thing because we need more study done into it. This is the thing. Um, we know it affects, or we think it affects this orbital frontal cortex, but more studies need to be done into the brain as well. So this part of the brain affects our decision-making processes, but also affects impulse control and things like that. So you're fighting against all these almost natural impulses in yourself to go and get this. It's difficult. You know, it takes a lot, a lot of willpower. And unfortunately, this is one of the things that's getting chipped away at as well. So we do need that kind of community social support people do need to rely on their friends and family mental health workers drugs workers and the friends family mental health workers and drugs workers unfortunately need to be a little bit more understanding and work with the person to find ways to help them stop doing that you know whether it's the same kind of interventions that we might use for self-harm and suicide a lot of it's going to be like suicide interventions you know staying with somebody and trying to re-engage those positive aspects again, you know, trying to help the brain make those positive connections with the things that we actually do need to keep us going and survive, like eating, seeing our friends and having positive, positive social interactions. Um, if you. I could maybe add to that as well, I think the, the biggest problem for people who use cocaine is when they run out of money and they've lost their friends and the relationships all break down. So drug services, are not always the first port of call. And there's no alternative medication used in this country yet. Um, you know, there's studies, that there's good links on SDF's channel. We had an event called What's the Crack? And I think they break it down really well, like to, to just to reinforce everything Lee's saying. We've got um, a pharmacist and also a health psychologist there that'll explain it all. But the set small things that we can do to make, reduce the harm, suicide um, ideation and, and being trained in, that sort of thing, but I think we need to widen the scope to where people yeah. are spent. And that's the thing that a lot of people with cocaine use, their first instance for getting help isn't necessarily with drug services. It could be with sexual health services, it might be with mental health services because they've got that suicidal ideation or because they're having panic attacks, suffering really bad anxiety. And they're not going to necessarily think it's the cocaine I'm using at the weekend that's causing this. Yeah, and also they'll be turning up to get um, debts wiped out by, you know, or looking at money programmes, you know, and I think also people look will be losing their job, it'll be job after job, you know, and so I think you're right, or they might not present saying it's this, it's cocaine, it will be I've lost my job, I'm yeah. skint. Um, so I think, yeah, if we can, but what Lee's just given us right there, people don't know that about cocaine, they really don't, they don't know enough about what it's actually doing to, in, in order to, make those connections about what it might be doing to the brain. So I think, you know, we probably need more of that information to people who use drugs first. Like I said, people know the short term risks and the immediate risks they're at when they go out at the weekend. And as bad as it sounds, unfortunately, these risks don't happen that often. So they get diluted and all the positive effects get reinforced. And that's something that you see on the soaps or that happens to somebody else, unfortunately, like a lot of drug risk taking behaviours. Unless it happens to you or a friend that's an urban myth, it's an urban legend, and it's just people telling us this stuff to put us off. So I think when we're educating people about cocaine, like sex and everything else, we do need to say, yeah, we understand it's fun, we know why you do this, but there's all these other things in the background here. It's not just these short term risks you've got to worry about, you know, there's all these potential long term effects, and it's not just you. And sometimes even taking that approach, I found with cocaine addicts I've worked with in the past seeing the bigger picture of talking about how it is affecting our friends and family, 
you've actually got more of an in to get them to want to do something about their use because their own self self is gone. But they can, they do still love their friends and their family and they want the best for them. So sometimes that's the best thing to take when it comes to cocaine use. You're still muted there, Eric. I'm aware of time, but I'm also aware that our session can run till 11 o'clock. So if folks are quite happy to keep having this conversation, let's go on for at least another 10 minutes. And you know, if folks have to go to another session, that's fine. But I think it's, it's we're, we're just getting there, isn't it? So if, I'm, if it's okay, I'll put up the other questions and other comments as well. So can, I maybe, mm -hmm. can I maybe answer that question, Eric, if that's all yeah. right? Yeah. Um, what we are doing within SDF is trying to make these links all the time between drug services, sexual health services and mental health services. And we, the training that we deliver is for staff across the board. And so we're trying to get, for example, sexual health services to ask their clients, their service users, about drug use and we're trying to get drug services to ask their service users about sexual and reproductive health. And that's what our training is fundamentally about. And that's the approach we are taking in terms of that cross collaboration. Thank you for that. There's another question we had, um, here we are. So from Alan. It is a similar question, but I'm um, kind of more focused on the kind of the the service users kind of aspect of not slipping through the net type. Yeah. And again, um, the MAT standards, the medication assisted treatment standards are helping with this, that we're seeing already that people who are needing access to services are being seen earlier than they would have in the past. So we're trying to get people seen very quickly. If they need some kind of support, some kind of treatment even, that they have access to that, hopefully within 24 hours actually. Um, so I think that's, we're beginning to, I hope, address that issue of pe people falling through the gaps. I don't know if Louise and Lee want to add something to that. Um, I think, you, you know, <laughs> Sometimes just asking people, have you got, are you all right for money? Are you all right for food? You know, asking some of these basic questions, but tuning into things like the minute somebody says, oh, I don't pay for my cocaine, that's a red flag. But the, the, the time and time we saw some of the other stuff coming through with the staff groups and, again, and since the pandemic is that people will advertise a, um, a night of sex if the, if the person buying the sex buys all the drugs, there's no money involved, it's a night of cocaine because it's the only way they can potentially afford it. That has other complications for, like you said, sexual injury. So I think it's about being really curious. And also, if there's people in asking for HIV tests because of their um, because their employer needs it, I would be questioning stuff like that. It's about being more curious and also treating every drug individually. Ask about why, how often. Sometimes, you know, you know, we, we just tick boxes, yeah, you use benzos, you use cocaine. We've got no picture built up. A, a, a urine analysis will only tell you what drugs are in somebody's system, not why they're using or what risks or what potential um, protective factors are there as well. You know, so I think, yeah, I think we are, there is, there's missed opportunities. But again, I, you know, I don't know, apart from us training staff and recognising them, um, and we use very interactive training to do that so people can come up with their own solutions for their own area. Sorry, I've on there. I think what Louise said there, never remembering to ask why. Asking why is one of the most important questions. And even if you can't help them, having those kind of good link ups between sexual health and mental health services and drug services, we really need to build those bonds and those links between places so we're not afraid to pick up the phone and just ask for a bit of help or get somebody to drop in and see one of their clients, even if it's just for one session. Sometimes that one session's you know, going to be the, the missing piece of the jigsaw in some cases. Yeah, and like you said, um, Lee, it's about us being really knowledgeable to be the connector on behalf of somebody. The systems are overwhelming. Yeah. Um, if, if staff have got time to make those links, maybe you only need to see somebody once and then they can go and access things themselves. So, yeah, pretty much about get, you know, getting all the information you can for anybody that walks in or knowing where you might be able to get it 
um, as well. So yeah, thanks. Great. We have a few questions coming in, so I'll just pop a few through. But before that, I want to say that as well. Yes, I agree with the kind of uh, brain education, I think is really important. I, when I work with young people and when I was an alcohol education worker as well, one of the key things I did was to draw the brain and let people know which part of the brain actually has the impact when people drink alcohol before a certain age, you know, you know, it's, it's all within the science of things. And perhaps one of the questions I have is, are there parallels to other types of drugs that we know more about that we can use to re to understand the effects of cocaine on the brain and, and then on behaviors? Do, do we have any kind of idea about that, Lee? Um, that's the thing with cocaine. In this country, it's an illegal drug and that's the end of it. Um, we're quite lucky that in America, it's still a Schedule II drug, which means that it is licensed for some medical use. So they are able to do studies in America. We are just waiting for them to, to do studies and feed the results back, unfortunately. But yeah, it's one of those things, a lot more research has to be done. Um, I'm really keen to share um, Laura Freeman's presentation for, for, for SDF because she actually explains it like the patterns of use of like alcohol. You know, some people will be absolutely fine, can go and get drunk every weekend and not have a dependency. Same with cocaine, but it's binge pattern off some use. Um, some, some becomes more daily. Um, and, and the other one sort of links it into like you're seeing all the alternatives, you know. So there's little, there's, there's evidence bases across Europe for putting in a different pharmacological, but none of it studied that well. Like we really pointed out to start with more research. There's um, things as well, like does certain mental health conditions that yeah. people have preludes to addiction. There's just so much more research into done in the area, not just for cocaine, but for so many drugs that. Yeah, and to answer your question as well, the, the Eric about you know. Yeah, it's, it's a stimulant drug. We haven't, you know, we, we haven't mastered it on its own yet, but there's some similarities between the way people use um, drugs. So I guess it is always about the person in front of you, though, will be different from the next person that comes in. Um, you know, we can gather trends. Like you said there, though, about the brain thing, and what, what for young people now, certainly giving them the crew resources, phenomenal. And they get them to make up a tech talk about the 500 reduction strategies for looking after your pals. Even starting with that stuff really produces some good stuff. But I like your brain one, and maybe that's the next way to go with it for some of the training. Thanks. Yeah. I'm quite happy to share the resources I created for Edinburgh Council for doing the youth work, risk-taking behaviours in the high schools. If anybody wants it, just give me a shout. It's not really been used. The group has dismantled. So you're very welcome to use my resources. And there is a, just to answer a few quick questions, there was a question about whether the research is available to read from uh, what Louise have said. Uh, yes, it is. It's in the chat. So the link is in there. Uh, Penny is in there. Um, right, there's a question here about for Louise again, very busy. Um, did any of the participants talk about condom use and the issues they face around this? Um, so interestingly, I probably should have said this, um, the younger cohort who are much more open about it have always got condoms, they even get their punters to pick up condoms and bring them in. Anytime you're passing, pick up condoms, big, big condom use. It was patchy. Um, other younger people are more likely to go for routine STI checkups as well. The over 35s who are, you know, um, who have been using drugs for a long time and really struggling, they were all less likely to. And, um, you know, people can put some offers in to remove condoms and stuff as well. Or it's an afterthought if cocaine's been involved, like Lee said earlier. So it's more about access and sexual health services. When we did our smears clinic that I spoke to yesterday, we were asking everybody, and actually it's a mixed, I would say about 50% of the, of the women attending for that were using condoms while they had sex. And that's not those selling sex. Um, yeah, if that helps. Great. Uh, I'm just going to keep bashing on until it's about um, 10.55, right? <laughs> if people want to stay on, great. Here's another question, since questions are popping in. So mental health services, how can we improve? I think we might want to answer this, but just first of all, can we advertise that we are cocaine friendly service? Because nobody's going to walk in to mental health services about cocaine, but it's like we need to advertise, we need to normalise the chat, the stigma stops people coming in. What if my work knows? What if this? The consequences of disclosing yourself as a drug user are, are massive. Like, let's 
you know, there will be consequences in some people. So if we can just sign up, just, you know, put it out there. I think that's me. I just think the more we talk, the less it, the stigma happens. And then I think it needs to become, all drug use needs to become a part of mental health questioning and not in that stigmatic way. You know, have you used substances lately? What substances have you used? How often do you use them? And it's trying to have that conversation without the person feeling judged and like they're going to get into trouble if they say yes. Uh, we found at Welfare before when we've asked people what they've used and they say nothing and they, they're quite obviously under the influence of something more than alcohol. When we said to them, look, so we can let you get asleep or let you rest and keep an eye on you and know what warning signs we're looking out for. They're able to be more open when they know you're trying to care for them and that it's their best interest that you have at heart. And I think, okay, we have to be like that as well. We have to say, look, it's okay for you to tell us you've used this. And it's actually helpful if we know, because then we know how to care for you. And we're not going to be as damaged. We're going to understand that you're going to make bad decisions because that's part of the illness from this. And that's part of what we need to help you fix. And we also, yeah. yeah, we also need to ask people, so how are you, you using cocaine? Because everyone's got a very fixed viewpoint, a big lines out at a party, but actually the people coming into services are injecting and smoking crack, mm -hmm. and very few are using it in what would be seen as a traditional movie style way that we all think of cocaine use and the way it's portrayed. So I, I think sex is involved as well, so they can cover those risky sex. Absolutely, because you cannot move on if you've got somebody who is harassing you for debt and you're feeling scared for your life and yet you're never going to be able to sit down and access a treatment plan. Um, but equally, if we can start with the harm reduction, making sure people have got enough injecting equipment, there's an HIV outbreak on that we all know and, and cocaine has had a link to that. So let's always speak about how people are using who, who with, and as, as and you know, because we know it increases libido and like Lee's illustrated about the different sexual practices that can come about. You see as well, having that talk about risk as well and being aware that we know you're going to make bad decisions and we accept that. So we need you to talk to us so we can put things in place, like making sure you have condoms, that you have enough injection equipment and we can put you in touch with all these services to make sure you have these things to make the bad decisions harder to make almost you know, like, we know you're going to do these things so let's make sure you've got plenty of clean injection equipment just in case plenty of condoms and exactly yeah we're hoping that you do manage to pick it up and use it and i think as well coming back to the alan's put in the chat about um the, the motivation stuff because i think i've lost my train of thought there was something he was saying i've lost that it's fine <laughs> <laughs> if it comes to me, I'll jump in. Cool. Okay, so I have one last question, which relates to kind of police and law enforcement, and we'll have a quick discussion about this. It's a very important point, um, and then we'll draw things to an end. We had a session yesterday about the uh, hepatitis C, um, and one of the presentations did talk about how they managed kind of testing within the context of kind of police custody so um so let, let sort of people who they reprimand there may be people who use drugs people who sell sex who may have to go um do you work with any way law enforcement bodies what the only thing i could say is that i'm going to draw on some research that women's support project did and it was around how do men how how, how do police respond to those involved in transactional sex and they don't even they're not entirely sure what to do either again it could be like the cannabis thing that it's like might de facto somewhere i don't know it might be what it might be descend depending on the circumstance in front of them i'll certainly link that research because it was part of a thing called hidden harm but there's also a really good youtube video in dundee where police officers speak so pe police officers are part of the discussion they were certainly part of the discussion on the criminal exploit childhood criminal exploitation for county lines um, you know, so there is evidence, us, me directly, unless they were on training, which they have been, um, I don't have that link personally, but the organisation does in lots of other ways. Adrian, do you want to rescue me before I start saying stuff that's not true? No, no, you've said exactly what I was going to say, that actually, particularly the course that Louise and I deliver around vulnerable young people, sexual health and drug use, we have had police officers and people working within criminal justice coming on those courses. And that's where we're talking about this stuff in a broader sense, 
but then we're narrowing it down to talking about specific drugs and the effects drugs have on sexual health. So we are linking in with them. And I think that's, as you say, Louise, SDF does in a wider context, but in terms of our work, we definitely do that in training. Um, I've just remembered the point I was going to make before, like like Lee was saying about we were talking about motivation and what we really need to do is listen to so what are the harms from that person's perspective is like I cannot lose my job. Then we need to start putting in things so they don't go on the weekend before because nine times out of ten there might be a Monday, Tuesday, or it might be, you know, last chance to keep my kids. Well, what can we do to put stuff in for you and a family to do something, a diversionary activity um, is really important. It's really important that they're provided low threshold access. So I think it's always on the person in front of you. What are your, what are you experiencing as harms? Um, bad, you know, the choices they make, they will decide, they'll say if they're bad or good and, and we, we give them that sort of information. So I think, yeah, on the motivation stuff, I might always be led by that person's, what they perceive as being really harmful to them. Great, thank you very much for that. That was a really, really engaging, really fruitful uh, discussion that we have about kind of sex, drugs, and how we can support people with different challenges in life with getting the best support that they they, they have a rights to really, basically. Um, it's not easy, that's why we're all doing the jobs that we're doing, but I think it's fair to say that it's a very rewarding, ongoing conversation that we need to have because there's just so many different partners involved in getting things right for folks. And um, before we go, just a couple of things to point out. So Louise has put up the link to the kind of research on the chat. So if you want to pick that up, it's over there before the session disappears. And um, before you go, the polls, there'll be a poll of three questions that's going to pop up on your screen. Um, so this will ask you about your experience of the session. So please just answer those um, to let us know what you think. And with that, I'd like to thank very much the presenters today and all the questions that's come in. So thank you very much, everybody, for a wonderful session on drugs and sex. I'm going to turn my camera off before it gets awkward. See you. And there's a half an hour break before the next session. Uh, there's going to be more conversations around sex and drugs tomorrow with me at 10 o'clock. Take care. Bye.